uh, logical arguments in favor of the fact that it is possible for components of living cell to be produced from completely non-living uh, molecules, right? And this is what Ure and Miller achieved in their experiment, in the, in the Miller's experiment, where they could find amino acid sugars, lipids, and all. And we also discussed that the first thing uh, that the, the first kind of living cell will need to evolve is a boundary, right? And that boundary in our cells is made up of lipids. And we know that lipids have a, have a property of assembly. They can assemble, uh, if they're present in water, we know that similar kind of molecules present in soap, they form micelle. And micelle formation is one example of self-assembly of these molecules that have a bipolar um, properties at bipolar ends. One is hydrophobic and one is hydrophilic. So they can self-assemble. And making a, a double layered membrane is also not um, an impossible feat, given that there are enough molecules that go in enough number of probability conformations, they can end up making folding onto themselves and make a double uh, membranous layer, right? Uh, everyone is clear and everyone agrees and satisfied by these points till now? Yes, sir. Okay. Now in today's class, what we will be talking about is the theory of evolution that was put forth by the very famous um, naturalist and um, observer of his time, evolutionary biologist of his time, uh, Charles Darwin. So you all must have heard of Charles Darwin, right? What do you know about Charles Darwin? You have heard this name before, Charles Darwin? <clears throat> no? Yes, yeah. sir. Yeah, okay. So the most famous piece of work of his is Origin of Species. And it's, it's a beautiful book written by him based on his, his voyage to, uh, to the islands in Galapagos. And he also, basically he traveled um, many places through sea and observed many life forms on different islands and gave a theory of natural selection, which is the most accurate uh, in explaining uh, evolution of life forms of very, various different life forms present on the earth, how there is so much of diversity on the planet. Now, the thing that uh, we are going to talk about first is that before Darwin, what was the thought of the field? So if we talk about before Darwinian era, I told you that people, uh, we were not thinking from a rational perspective of um, what led to all these life forms. And most of the powerful uh, groups were either uh, religious thinkers or philosophers or the church itself that, 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 that has driven a lot of early science and thinking and philosophy. But what they were not thinking and what they were not questioning were the facts that were already um, stated as, as facts, quote unquote, in the religious textbooks. So it was believed by most of the philosophers and thinkers of the time that all these life forms that are present around us, they are a result of special creation. So the theory of special creation was based on some fundamental ground rules, okay? Some characteristic of this theory, which was never challenged and no one thought uh, anything against it or even to think does it make sense or not? So this theory, um, everywhere around the world, various different uh, practices, cultures, and faith have slightly different modification of it, but the grand central theme is that 
all this uh, first of all first theme was that all living organisms whether they are different species or different types whether they are flying in the air whether they are living in the water whether they are roaming on the land whatever we see today were created as such like if i see a horse now in 2023 the way a horse looks now it always looked the same you know even thousands of years ago it was the same so the first fundamental of this theory is that all living organisms were created as such so no change the form is static there was no change in the form because that's how creator created a horse uh, he or she wanted to create a horse and he and she created a horse so all living organisms around us were created as such okay so basically it hints towards the fact that the diversity on earth if everything was created as such like it is present at the moment and uh, according to this theory there was a day of beginning and there'll be an end and till that till between that period everything will be static uh, uh, for for every life form so basically this theory then tells that the diversity was always the same since creation and will always be the same in the future so basically what we are talking about is biodiversity of living forms so biodiversity is always the same or you can write biodiversity has always been the same Well, I can just write was here. Biodiversity was always the same and will remain the same in future. Because according to the theory of special creation, uh, whatever the creator wanted to create, it was done. And now the process of creation is done. Everything is created. So just like a painting is complete. it's complete and nothing is being created anymore now so it will stay the painting will stay the same similarly the biodiversity will stay the same was the second uh, main characteristic of this theory the third thing that this theory said that earth is a few thousand years old okay so earth is approximately 4 to 5000 years old Not not older than that. Four thousand to five thousand years old. Now all these ideas were strongly challenged in the nineteenth century, the beginning of nineteenth century, uh, which is like when the when the year two, um, <clears throat> when the in the year to which people started thinking rationally these these concepts started getting challenged now one of the one of the easiest way we, we can't disprove all of them at the same time so different people went went against different aspects of the theory and tried started testing it so the good thing about testing in science is many people think that scientists believe that there is uh, that everything that can be proven by science is the only thing that exists that's not true now, we don't believe as scientists or students of science we are never taught to be arrogant about saying that see anything everything that can only be proven by science is true there are truths that science cannot prove as of yet so that's very clear if some day someone really scientifically proves there is a heaven it will be a discovery but till then uh, you have to be agnostic about it you can't you, you can't you know uh, with scientific evidence say that it does not exist 
But what is true about science is the opposite. If something is disproven through science, then it's false, always. If I can disprove something, like if I can disprove that uh, eating this particular drug or taking this particular drug has no effect on blood pressure by doing tests and proving that, see there's, <laughs> sorry, excuse me. Uh, but by doing tests and I prove that there is no effect on hypertension at all, then it is false for sure. Do you, do you understand the difference, everyone? Yes, no? Is it, does yes, that make sir. sense to you? Yeah. So similarly, for first thing that all living organisms around us were created as such, that's not true because it has been disproven by evidences through fossil very, very easily. And we, we know, so uh, 500 years ago, there was uh, nothing like a Pomeranian dog. There was nothing like these small pocket-sized kittens that uh, people keep as pets nowadays. Many of these plants, which are also living systems, were not existing on the planet uh, 500 years ago. And a lot of it came through inbreeding uh, selections, artificial selection, and so on. So all living organisms around us were not created as such. They, they evolved and uh, breeding, artificially breeding and creating new varieties and new, um, new kind of organisms and subspecies is, an, is a proof that if human can do this, do it with their limited power and knowledge about genetics and how to tweak it, then nature in which this whole evolution has happened over millions of years can of course create new species. So all living organisms around us were not created as such. And if we take the fossil records of organisms of the past, they don't look like organisms of the present. Okay, and that also disproves simultaneously. So this point was disproved. And simultaneously, fossil records also helped us to disprove this point that biodiversity was always the same. It was not. We know that in the in in the, in the past, there were uh, dragonflies as huge as one meter from their tip to toe. Now we see dragonflies a few inches, not more than that. We know that uh, from fossil records that back in in a few million years ago, the largest uh, animal in the water was many a times huge than blue whale, which is the largest animal now because of we, we got the fossils. So biodiversity was very different back then. Biodiversity is very, very different now. And the way planet is going forward in evolution, biodiversity will continue to change and be very different, right? At one point of time, this planet was ruled by reptiles. And you, when you dig fossils, you get to layers where you will find more reptilian uh, fossils and very less and very small in size mammalian fossils. So mammals were not dominating the planet. It was all reptiles. The fall of reptiles made mammals come up and take the arena. So whenever there is gap of power or absence of power, something comes up and takes the... When reptiles could not survive, because one caveat that reptiles have is that reptiles are cold-blooded. If conditions are not in their favor, if they do don't get enough heat for their body, they have more chances of perishing, but mammals can survive because they are warm blooded, right? Even if they eat a little bit of food, they can maintain their own body temperature and survive. Their organs, brain and everything can survive. So that allowed mammals to come up, okay? And what is the evidence for that? The evidence for that is very simple organism around us, which is mouse. How many of you have seen a mouse in the daytime? Very rarely they are active during the daytime. They are mostly active during the night time. And I think Tom and Jerry has taught us this very well. That mouse comes out from their holes in the night time when humans are sleeping and they are very active and look for food and do. So they are nocturnal organisms. And all our ancestors, all mammalian ancestors were nocturnal. They were not um, active in the day because in the day, big lizards, which were dinosaurs and, and, and ancestors of them were roaming on the earth. So they will just hunt mammals if their mammals were small. If they are roaming around in the daytime when their predators are there, they will, be, they will be hunted. So they chose a time to be active when predators are not active. So reptiles won't be active in the night. Why? 
because night time is cold cooler time you don't get energy in your body heat in the form of heat so you cannot keep your body hot and warm so reptiles go and sleep when it's cold that's why reptiles go to hibernation during winters but mammals uh, not do not go uh, into hibernation necessarily uh, so all the mammal ancestors who are nocturnal and that that is very evident with a lot of mammals still humans changed this habit because when they started evolving uh, i'll tell you in during human evolution when did human started uh, hunting and taking risks not all ancestors of human were hunters or meat eaters we were very different our species was very different like our species were not there the species before us was very different uh, in in everything that they used to do but we'll talk about it in the last section so this point also got rejected because of fossil evidences of flora and fauna that it was very different back in time the third point that earth is approximately a few thousand years old is also the most bizarre thing because as during the 20th century science evolved and discovered new techniques to date any matter with confidence how old is that and how do we do that how many of you know about carbon dating technique it carbon dating sounds like when i heard the word for the first time i thought okay what what is so special about carbon and who is carbon dating by the way carbon dating is a technique to date back matter and scientists were in were actually in love with this technique when they got to know oh using carbon you can actually tell the age with some with some accuracy of very very old uh, even fossil fossil uh, materials so all the scientists were literally dating the carbon dating technique back then to to figure out uh, truths so carbon date anyone has an idea what is carbon dating anyone would like to speak up uh, anything that you know we can take up from there iram aisha rabia parker what do you think about uh, have you heard or read or in your schools what is carbon dating been discussed or taught to you no sir no okay so uh, what happens with carbon dating is we know that uh, there are isotopes of carbon right what is normally what 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 is the atomic mass and atomic number of carbon so common is c12 right carbon is 12 am i correct right yes, nitrogen is 14 but there is c13 and c14 as well which are very very trace amounts and every element or every uh, in every molecule or a compound atoms have a half life so for carbon that half life is around I'm not sure if it's around um a lot like it's 5000 no not 5000 something something years in thousands so in a very long time carbon 12 converts into carbon 13 in a in a, in a organic matter okay so if you take any sample from my body and since my body has been in existence just you know few years like as much as my age is which is nothing as compared to the half life of carbon so you will not get uh, any any conversion ratio of c12 into c13 like very 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 negligible but if something is dead and buried in the soil for like thousands of years then you take that sample and you try to see we are not trying to see any organic matter no organic matter is like has to be intact but there will be carbon because the whole body is carbon based that organism at one point of time had a lot of carbon so now in that uh, bone or whatever is preserved as fossil in that we will see how much c13 concentration is present and by that ratio we will we can back calculate that how much time it would have taken for this amount of c12 to become c13 and using carbon dating we can date back um the age of organisms to very accurately to 50000 to 1 lakh years 
And if you have to go beyond that, then we have scientists have developed another more, more uh, uh, fancier and better technique called uranium dating. So the half-life of uranium is longer uh, and you can, you can actually, I'm not wrong, it's longer or shorter, but using this, you can go to millions of years back in the past and to, to very, to some degree of accuracy, you can say that this must be the age, right? You cannot exactly tell uh, this is 50,549 years old, let's say, but you can say that it is somewhere between 50,000 to 52,000 years old. It can't be 10,000 or 4,000 years old at all, seeing the ratio. Does that make sense, everyone, this technique? Thumbs up if you understand. That, that is not necessary for your exams, but to understand how we disprove the third point. So you take, if Earth is 5,000 years old, and if that's true, then nothing on Earth should be older than that, right? Not even rocks, forget about life, okay? Life also should not be older than that. Even rocks, any, any fossil tree shouldn't be older than that. But if you just take rocks that has any carbon in it, and you try to, or a piece of wood, which is, in, uh, which is fossilized, and uh, if you carbon date it, you will know that there are pieces of wood, like wood fossils or trees, whose age is more than this thing. So there are trees who are living for more than 4,000 years ago. And there are rocks that have been found to be millions of years old. So this outright disproves the third thing using science that none of these characteristics which are which are the part of theory of special creation is true. So this was rejected. And now after all these ideas were rejected, a hunt for finding truth started and people started finding that, okay, what can we prove then? Uh, this is something that's all got disproved. So Charles Darwin came up and he didn't like came up specifically for this purpose, but he was a naturalist. He wanted to find, actually he started with, uh, and it's a very interesting story. He was, he was funded by uh, the king and the queen of Great Britain, like the royal, your majesty. And he got a ship, which is called Beagle. And the name of, the, of Charles Darwin's ship, it was not his own ship, but it was called HMS Beagle. Okay. HMS simply stands for His Majesty's Ship. Okay. So that's, that's very, that's very uh, characteristics of kings and rulers, no? So His Majesty's Ship Beagle was given to Darwin to go and explore the world and bring evidence in, in support of, um, you know, the creator or the creation that you know, church will be very happy to tell everyone around that, see, you know, God has created such a beautiful world around. It has so much of diversity, this and that and all. So Darwin started, Darwin said, okay, I get to explore the world. I'm more than happy. And I'll, I'll, I'll let you know whatever I find. I'll document things properly. So he went on, uh, he boarded the ship and he went around the world. He, he took many stoppages, the most prominent being um, the Galapagos Island. Uh, and the Galapagos Island were very interesting because there he thought logically and he found evidences to, to, to prove that actually, sure. yes. So sorry to interrupt. Uh, no, no, it's I fine. wanted to know what is uh, a naturalist? Naturalist. Oh, so back then, um, you can call Darwin a scientist, but the way back then there was no, no way to get a formal education and to be called a scientist. So scientist is someone who does science professionally and who's, who's, who's dedicated, who, whose profession is doing science and finding things or proving things. Back in time, um, all these people were called philosophers or those who, want, who are working and ex observing and exploring nature were called naturalists. So they were nature explorers, the living world's explorers, right? So like, 
it's not like you you do this you get a phd and you are a scientist in neuroscience because you did a phd in neuroscience those things did not exist back then so naturalist is someone who explores nature takes observations make theories try to find evidences of those theories in nature itself it's not like you take something to the lab and do an experiment in the lab and prove a molecular reasoning behind it so darwin didn't have a lab of himself he was not working in lab he was not proving any molecular mechanisms uh, like mendel was doing back in time mendel was really doing experiments in his garden using pea he was mixing genes and uh, observing phenotypes right but darwin was just moving roaming around looking at uh, the plethora of flora and fauna the diversity of animals and plants and was making records and that gave him idea of natural the theory of natural selection and that natural selection drives evolution uh, is, is that clear uh, you know yes so a naturalist yeah right so he went to galapagos and he realized uh, that it's it can't be true that all living organisms were created the same he also found evidences to to say that existing living systems like existing life forms if we if we talk about let's say uh, let's say if we talk about ants spiders so there are why there are 20000 different species of ants okay so the question is if you want to create an ant or an organism like ant you will just get the best if i'm creating something i'll create the best why will i create 20000 different versions of the same ant you know why will i create uh, 25000 different versions of spiders and ranging from the tiniest to the biggest tarantula they all share some common features which which helps them to classify like you know the classification that you studied in class 11 it it helps to organism it helps us to classify organisms but at the same time they also have lot of differences that tells us that these differences might have come because of some external pressure like giving an example penguin is also a bird and parrot is also a bird now they both come in the bird category for what reason for the reasons that you know we know that they both lay eggs we know that they both have hollow pneumatic bones we know that their internal organs kind of uh, make uh, are like that they now we have techniques to do uh, gene sequencing the whole genome sequencing will know that this is a bird because it has a all the genes that a bird has it has a beak uh, it has it doesn't have a four arm but it has flippers which should be feathers if it was a parrot but since it is a penguin living in the cold antarctic regions on ice it 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 does not need to fly so the 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 flippers or the of the penguin are nothing but a modified version of feathers of a parrot now if both of these two are birds the difference is because of where they live and what pressures are on them and what helps them to survive better now if you are living on a ice sheet where for for as far as you see there is nothing but just ice where would you go to find food you will go in the water and if you have feathers that won't help you much in the in the water to hunt but if you have flippers you can use it so if you see a underwater video of a penguin on youtube and if the water is very clear and still the way a penguin swims in water it you will feel like if as if it's flying in the water because the movements the kind of bone structure is very similar but the fact that it's a flipper helps it to wade through water find food and 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 uh, survive so darwin got an idea that this degree of difference is because of um selection pressures and he also concluded through in his book and in his theory that there must have been organisms in the past that we are not aware of who died and are extinct now and there will be organisms in the future who have who we have not seen as of yet and will evolve eventually like 50000 from now we don't know 
uh, what kind of uh, new frog species you will find in an Amazon forest because of some selection pressures under which that forest is is um, uh, allowing the organisms to uh, speciate. So he did. He said these two things, and the third thing he said that every life form is gradually evolving. Uh, it's so gradual and slow that we might not see it in front of our eyes all the time, but Darwin at that point of time didn't know about viruses and their evolution. So when COVID started, let me, let me give an example of how fast evolution can work for the simplest of organisms, which is viruses. So viruses somewhere lie at the edge of living and non-living. When they are inside their host, they behave like living. When they are outside their host, they are just like particles. But viruses evolve very rapidly. Okay. Sorry, I lost uh, electricity, but we'll be back in some time. Uh, you all can hear me, right? Clearly? Yes, sir. I, yeah. So viruses evolve rapidly. Just within like two, three years of COVID becoming a pandemic and spreading throughout the world, we have, if not... 10, 20, we have more than those strains, different strains of the same virus. So it's all COVID, but you, you must have heard of alpha, beta, omicron, theta, epsilon, and so on, right? All these are variants that has evolved when they, when they, uh, when they go into a host, the host immune system tries to fight back. The virus wants to replicate. Now the virus have to change something in it so that the host immune system, it can fool the host immune system and the host immune system will constantly try to recognize it. So the virus has a pressure on it to survive inside the body, which is to evade the host immune system. And this tussle, this tug of war uh, happens very, very fast because viruses reproduce very fast. Within days, a few hundred viruses in your body can become millions and trillions within days. So their reproduction rate is, replication rate, sorry, I should say, is super fast. So the, the chances of mutations, just random mutations making some changes in their genes is also super fast. So within days, months, weeks, years, viruses can evolve right in front of our eyes. If you go to something more complex than virus, which is a bacteria, it won't take just one year, but it will take a few decades. And that we also see in front of our eyes. Uh, before there was a penicillin uh, discovered, we were not able to kill a lot of bacteria. When penicillin discovered, it was like a magic drug. One drop and even in the vicinity of that thing, there will be no bacteria surviving. But just in 60, 70 years, 80 years, bacteria have learned and they have evolved to have mechanisms that can fight back that anti antibiotic, either by degrading it or by flushing it out of their own system, which they were not able to do 70 years ago. So bacteria evolved right in front of our eyes. When we go more complex than that, like insects and things, it takes a few hundred years or a few thousand years uh, for mammals, which are complex like elephants, tigers, and all these uh, organisms, it will take millions of years. So does that make sense to everyone? And this is what Darwin said, that regardless of what living system it is, it is constantly evolving. More complex the system, more time it will take to evolve into something very different from what it was. But the changes are gradual. Even in humans, um, I, I ke I'll keep coming back to humans and uh, coming back and forth. Even in humans, if you just take the data of uh, 200 years of like, because biology is not older than 200 to 300 years. People were not thinking in terms of living systems before that. But even if you think about 200 years of humans evolution, you will see significant, small, tiny, but significant changes in human physiology as well. And in the way they, they are, they are, they are now living. In fact, I was just you know, I was reading a research article that claims that in, in the last 100 years, the mean body temperature of humans have gone down by a fraction of a degree. It's not one degree, but it's like point some degrees. So humans 
body temperature is falling down. Now, what are the reasons? It's multifactorial, but you can count it, this as one evolutionary uh, thing. And based on how we are using and disusing and how much we are using and disusing, uh, uh, not using, by disusing I mean not using, a lot of our organs and abilities, people have also predicted how future humans, human species will be like. Okay, we have a question in the chat, I guess. So Parker has a question. Is it true that millions of years ago, humans were very tall, like about 20 feet? No, that's not true. In fact, the opposite is true. Uh, there has never been a human species or a hominid species that we have found that were taller than humans. Uh, we have found a lot of hominin fossils. When I say hominin fossils, I, I'm talking about uh, early human fossils because the bones kind of get calcified and become stone and got preserved between layers of mud and stone. So all those fossils say that uh, from the point where the Homo genus evolved, at one point of time, there were many species of Homo living on the planet. Have you ever thought that we have multiple species of uh, Leo, like every genus, if we talk about the genus of lions and tigers. So tiger is uh, Leo tigris, um, a lion is Leo leo, and a panther is Leo pardus. So for the same genus, there are multiple species that are living. But for Homo, it's just sapiens, Homo sapiens. Where are Homo erectus, Homo neanderthal, Homo habilis, all these, where are these species? They're all extinct. But, and that gives us a misconception that maybe it was linear. First came this, and this is how, this is also some, somewhat NCRT gives an impression of that first come Australopithecus, sorry, Ramapithecus, Australopithecus, Homo erectus, and it was not like a chain. At, at one point of time, there were some overlapping species that, was, that were inhabiting the planet at the same time. So there could be Homo neanderthals and Homo sapiens at the same time overlapping for a brief 10,000 years. And whenever there will be two of the same species, same um, genus, they will have similar feeding habits, similar living grounds. If you keep one tiger and one lion in the same forest, they will compete for the same gazelle or zebra, right? So either they will evade each other, they will mark their territories that I will go there and not go there because the lion goes there and something like that, or they will have a conflict and they will fight and the stronger one will win. And that is what happened. Homo sapiens, we are the reason that all other Homo species are extinct. We outlived, we outnumbered by rep reproduction, we outnumbered and we were, we outsmarted them. Our warfare strategies were better. But what Parker is asking that millions of years ago, so millions of years ago, there was no human species. There was no Homo. Okay, like three, four million years ago, there was no Homo genus. I'll tell you exactly when, how back we find in time evidences of human evolution. Humans are just like a snapshot in the history of life on earth. We are, if, if I say that the history of earth is like 24 hours of a clock, the existence of human is fraction of a second. It is not even one second. So we are very recent and we have evidences for that, but they were never taller than Homo sapiens. Okay. Uh, they were in fact very short, like three feet, four feet. Now we have sapiens as long as seven feet, eight feet, even the longest homo sapien is nine feet, but they were all very, very short. And th there is a reason for that, that we will discuss during human evolution. There's a logical reason for why um, um, when homo evolved, they were shorter and why longer homos could not survive. So we have not found any evidence for that, right? All the evidence support that they will shorter humans. Is that is that okay, Parker? Does that answer your question? Yes. So. Yeah. Yes. Uh, my, I have a question. Yes. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, yes. Sir. So it it has been um, argued that human evolution has uh, stopped because humans now have adapted uh, environmentally as well as culturally. And it has also been validated by most of the scientists that there is there has been no uh, biological change or evolution nearly around 40,000 to 50,000 years ago. 
So is that true? No, I think that's again, some of the misconceptions spread through cultural groups and WhatsApp. That's not science, that's pseudoscience. In fact, what I'm telling you about is just a, just a study based on data of last hundred years of humans across the globe tells that there are changes happening in human physiology. They are very slow, but we are catching it on the frame of hundred years, but there are. And if you talk about 40,000 years, that's not at all entirely true. Um, humans have are changing rapidly, like not as fast as other organisms, because we do not have, you are right in a sense that we do not have very strong selection pressures on us because we, our SOP is our intelligence. Whenever it comes to adapting to environment, in fact, you said that humans have adapted to environment. I will argue counter to that. Humans don't adapt to environment. They make environment according to their needs. So if uh, you live in, uh, if you're living in uh, Russia, the colder part of the Russia or Europe, you will have your homes heated. If you're living in, in it's very hot, you get air conditioners in your environment, heat surrounding pool. Camel cannot do that. So camel has to evolve to withstand heat so that it can survive in a Gulf country. But, oh, sorry, you know, missing my voice is cracking. Let me stop my video for some time. Is my voice okay now, you know? Let yes, me know sir. when it is fine. Okay, so I'll just repeat what can you I said. Yes. yes, yes, I'm repeating. So I, uh, what was the last thing you heard clearly? So you were, what was the last? Yeah, yeah, you were talking about adaptations in the environment, yes. like in Russia. Right, right, yeah. right. So I was saying that uh, instead of saying that humans have adapted to their environment, the counter argument is more, um, it makes more sense that we make our environment uh, comfortable as per our needs. So someone who's living in the colder countries like the Russia and the Europe, uh, their homes have sent facility, right? If you go to Canada or the Northern side of US, every home and the floorings have central heating facilities so that they can stay warm when the outside temperature is minus 15 degrees Celsius, right? No human will survive properly in minus 15 degrees Celsius, but polar bears can because they have to adapt to their environment, they make changes in themselves. So that way you are right that humans are not under stronger selection pressures, but evolution is happening through changes in the genome. Humans are doing sexual reproduction. Sexual reproduction leads to meiosis, recombination, and recombination leads to genetic variation. Genetic variation will always cause some or the other uh, like changes in human species. So uh, a human species that's living near equator and a human species that living near the poles for many generations won't be exactly same. Their physiological capabilities, their ability to tolerate temperature, their feed, food, feeding habits, their ability to digest one kind of versus the another will all be very different. That is also a part of human evolution. And talking on scale of thousands of years, we have evidences that humans started agriculture somewhere around 30,000 to 40,000 years ago. Before that, we were not settlers. We were not, because once you start agriculture, you will settle where your fields are, right? You cannot do agriculture on a piece of land and then move away from there and come next year, right? You will be there, protect it. And that's how civilization started settling. Before that, we were very different. Our genes were, uh, our physiology was very different. We, we, we were hunter gatherers. Then we settled as farmers. So 40,000 years ago, humans were living in caves and they had very different physiology from what the humans that live in cities or even in rural areas today have. Uh, does that make sense? You know, so that's not true that humans are not evolving. Humans are evolving. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, so anything that that's that says that you know scientists have proved any any statement that starts with this uh, is more dubious. You, you shouldn't just believe in it because it says. So it's like NASA has proven that 
द होल कॉस्मोस सिंग्स अ पर्टिकुलर सॉन्ग और और हम्स अ पर्टिकुलर वर्ड बट हाउ हाउ हैज does nasa has no other job first first of all and if this is important to find that whether so it's true that there are there are sound notations that you can give to every planet and galaxy but it's not that cosmos sing something that we know already or is or which is in my religious textbook or someone's religious textbook so people when they use science to prove that see my beliefs are superior because they are backed by science that is the first thing that they should not do see your beliefs does not have to be backed by science remember we started this chapter saying that if i respect my father that doesn't have to be backed by science and evidence right i will continue to respect my father because he is my father and for that i don't need the support of science the support of science is required to for 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 very very different things which are not beliefs which are truths and facts so my beliefs may be false someone's belief might be better than someone's in in terms of moral responsibilities someone's belief might be better than someone in terms of economical responsibilities but that's a very different thing so whenever you get some message such messages or facts try to think logically that does it make sense has it been through rigorous scientific uh, criticism is this method uh, the way to do or to prove this because many things we just hear right and then it 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 just goes on as chinese whisper anyway so coming back to hms beagle uh, very good questions though both from iram and parker thank you so much for bringing those in but uh, you figured out you understood what darwin said that just write down a few points what darwin concluded so write down charles darwin concluded just bullet points you can write bullet points and say what he he, he concluded so charles darwin concluded that existing life forms existing life forms share similarities among themselves share similarities among themselves but they also share similarities but they also share similarities with with extinct life forms with with extinct life forms make sense for example if you look at we were talking about it if you look at the the claws and the the structure of bones of chicken you will see it's very common to a t rex the only thing if you can just zoom uh, if you can just make a normal chicken uh, 500 times bigger and stronger you will think that it's a dinosaur only right uh, so if birds share similarities with reptiles or reptilian uh, life of the past there can be two possibilities for this to happen either if you believe in the theory of creation then the creator took the same template that it used to design dinosaurs and used the same template to design bird or the other one which can be tested is they are related in evolution and might have a common ancestor from which these two things evolved that's why something stayed similar and something changed as pressures different pressures were acting on them because they were living in different conditions so this was his first thing second he said uh every life form is under gradual evolution process every life form is under gradual evolution process
and you know the most interesting and funny thing is darwin for most of his life even in fact when he was doing this whole voyage and he was writing this book he never directly uh, kind of said that this goes uh, on face against the existence of uh, what different cultures believe as as god so he never defied that because he said that science that's not the job of science to defy something which which we cannot defy by you know uh, what we can say by evidences in fact he was a believer for most of his own life when he was doing this work and finding out links between organisms in evolution only towards the end of his life he 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 he, he became an atheist and started writing that we don't need a creator to create the create the uh, living world but even if you will read origin of species which he which was the most um greatest work of his you will see that his arguments are very rational they're not emotional they're not coming from an uh, atheist point of view or a believer's point of view it's coming from a scientific point of view and all these evidences that he talks about are now verified and justified so along with darwin there was one more person who should be given credit but sometimes books don't give is alfred wallace alfred wallace and darwin were contemporaries and they were working on similar lines to find the hidden truths of natural world and how or how different kind of species have come up and how do they exist were they existed forever or something so alfred wallace again another naturalist he worked on the archipelago uh, island the malay archipelago and he also came to similar conclusions in a very independent research of his so it was not just one person in the whole world saying something about natural evolution it was also alfred wallace and when darwin got to know of alfred wallace work and darwin knew that he he has he has to publish and he can publish but he also gave uh, due credit to wallace and he told wallace that let's publish together let's tell the world what we both figured out so alfred wallace wrote a essay a article on on population evolution um, of organisms that darwin liked a lot and it, he also included many aspects of it in his own book with due credits so that is something very good about you know scientists back in time they were looking forward to find truth and there was no bitter competitiveness though there was in many other you know scientists do as we can talk about sometime but when they both realize each other's uh, contribution they should uh, end off what to say credit each other's contribution so when the when these two people independently came to similar conclusions using similar evidences then the world kind of started believing in the theory of evolution but it was still a theory based on some observations done by two people and other people verified the same observations they said yeah it makes sense darwin is talking about some birds uh on the island so you know about darwin finches we will talk about you have you heard the word darwin's finches yes sir so finches are small birds that darwin found scattered throughout different islands of of uh, the, uh, the galapagos and he observed something very crucial between these birds which which make which uh, kind of made him conclude that all these birds have evolved from a common bird like a common species okay and how did he do that by just observing their feeding habits their living habits the fresh Changes that uh, are on them, and why they have they have they have very subtle changes in their beak shape and their body size, and that that explains their diet, their uh, their habitat, and what pressure natural selection pressures were on them, and that was a very very uh, amazing thing, and it that whole thing became famous at as Darwin's finches uh, theory. but still we need proof right as i told you science does not just believe uh, even if it accepts it keeps looking for evidences to prove or disprove it so just because darwin said it 
doesn't make it true. So let's go and talk about what are the evidences of evolution. Okay, and this is something we will spend some time on. Most of all the time of today's class will be spent on this. What are the evidences of evolution? And the evidences should not just come from a single faceted or a single a factorial thing. Like, let's say you are saying that fossils are the evidences. What if I don't want to believe in fossils? What if, like, how do you know that, you know, these are just bones? How do you know what the bones look like uh, on the basis of it? You are reconstructing an organism. How can you say that the organism looked exactly like what you are reconstructing it? No one has seen that organism. So we will say that, no, it's not just the bones, but we also have impressions in the mud that gives us a lot of insight. The, a skeptic person can still say that, no, I don't believe it. The impressions are not clear, which scientists found from ice sheets. So if something gets trapped in ice sheets during an avalanche or something like a mammoth, you have seen ice age, all of you have seen Ice Age, the animated yes, movie. Sir. I think it's very popular among kids. Yeah. So in Ice Age, you, you know that there are the ancestors of elephant were very hairy back then in the Ice Age. They, they were called mammoths, holy mammoths. And they have um, very, very long tusks and very big, huge fur covered body. And their ancestors were mastodons um, and mammoth, mammoth. Okay, just one second. Is it better now? Is it, is it better? Just wait for a few seconds. It will stabilize. Is it better now? Yes. Yeah, so I was saying that uh, uh, scientists have found a baby mammoth preserved in ice. And when something gets preserved in ice, it does not degrade. It does not, you know, perishes. So this fossil is actually trapped in time and in ice. Like it's cryopreserved. It still have all the hair. Everything, organs are not uh, degraded. And you can say that, see, I found an organism from prehistoric times as it is, not just the bones. But let's say someone is very dismissive and says that I will not believe in fossils, give me something else. So you should know that what are all the different evidences of evolution. So in today's, uh, in this part for your syllabus, what I'm going to talk about are uh, evidences from present time, not just in fossils. So first evidence is the fossil evidences, right? Um, um, so write down. First is fossils. Fossil evidence. And what are fossils? So if you just want to define it, because sometimes they ask in board exams, define fossil record and what are fossils. So fossils are remains of hard parts of life forms. So all the softer parts like skin, tissues, muscles, organs, hairs, and, 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 um, and these soft, soft parts will always be degraded when organism dies and it's buried. But if the organism is trapped, let's say in, in some thing um, like between two rocks and the rocks got buried so the harder parts which are like bones which will not be reached by all the uh, degrading agents like all the detritivorous they will not reach there the rock around it will solidify and millions of years later you will found that big rock you will dig it and you will find that oh there are bone structures inside it that you will arrange it and you will find that oh these bones look like something like a horse, but those will be ancestors of horse back in time. So you know that horse evolution is also very well studied. Nowadays, horse have hoofs, two hoofs, right? 
back in time horse evolved from organisms that used to have three toes three toed and four toes before that so from four toed organism it evolved into a three toed organism it evolved into a two toed and then the hoofs came which we have in the current horses uh, present horses so those are fossil records so write down rocks um buried in rocks buried in rocks contains evidence of life forms buried in rocks are present evidence of life forms or contains evidence of life forms that died that died long ago that died long ago when that rock layer was being formed when that rock layer was being formed and what do i mean by this is if i'm digging in ground and i reach a layer where i start finding similar kind of fossils so that tells me that that layer because the crust of earth is very very dynamic layer keeps forming and going down and up how many of you know and you will be surprised if you don't know that a major portion of saharan desert and the african region was at one point of time today it is a desert at one point of time sahara was seabed it was at the bottom of the sea how many of you know that it's very difficult to imagine a, a desert which we see in front of our eyes now big region of land to believe that it was at the bottom of the sea right because these tectonic plates are moving so at one point of time india was not where it is like as a as a land mass it was way down and it was very close to africa and antarctica but all these sentences how does they make sense uh, are you all hearing me clearly because no one is responding yes yes sir yeah so if i say that sahara was sea bottom at one point of time some part of it what evidence would you like to have to believe in this statement or you will say that it is not at all possible i will never believe this statement anything if i tell you then you will believe in it yeah i got something in the chat parker says dead fish fossils yeah that's great parker so if you dig the sand of sahara and you go down to a layer where still it's the 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 dry sand but buried in it are evidences of fish fossils or kind of life forms that only is present at the bottom of the sea at the moment like corals or like hard substances like shells will you believe that sahara at one point of time because otherwise someone have to in a very very you know hard working manner take lots and lots of organisms from seabed and dump them into sahara no one did that right we find now in regions of sahara the fossils of organisms as big as whales so a whale like fossil is found in sahara now if it is a whale it shouldn't be living in desert right it should be living in the ocean and when it will die it will get buried on the ocean bed so that gives us an evidence that it was an ocean bed that got elevated as tectonic plates moved and it came up in layer similar thing is with all the mountains ranges like himalayas himalayas are the longest tallest mountain range because they are the youngest to form how did they form when the indian land mass started moving up north it collided with the with the what we call as the chinese land mass and because two things collided because of pressure the the immediate layer that collided will rise up 
you know it's a distortion so it rises up so what was what was at 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 some time at the ground la layer or below ground layer now got risen in the form of a mountain you know several hundred of feet tall so this is how layer keeps going up and down and out because earth is not a static landmass it is moving constantly but again if you if you you say that this is also a story then we have satellite images people it, it's been almost around you know 50 to 60 years that we have satellites in orbit taking close look of earth and every landmass and these satellite images just in 6 7 decades have told us that indeed earth is static land masses are moving very slow based on these images you can say you can see and tell that the asian subcontinent is moving towards japan or you can say japan is moving towards the asian subcontinent something around if i'm not wrong 6 inches every year now 6 inch for a country is too less right but we have um sensors that can sense that difference in their in, in the coast so we know that things are moving still yes so first is fossil evidence that tells us that evolution has happened and this shows right down fossil shows <coughs> that new life forms have arisen fossil evidence shows that new life forms new life forms have arisen from from previous life forms at different times in the history from previous life forms at different times in history and this history is biological history not the history that we study in books the medieval kings time it's millions of years time frame so this is first thing Yes, Ir. Go ahead. Uh, so uh, there are type of fossil called as compression fossils. These are the excreta of old old organism. So mm -hmm. we uh, yeah. kind of uh, get to know how old is the organism um, by these fossils. But how right. do you like uh, excreta will degenerate within the soil, right? So how do you obtain? Right. Exactly. So that's a very good question. That's in in fact that that applies to everything. so when we bury our deads humans when humans bury uh, uh, their deads uh, humans have been burying their dead since very long right but if you bury something someone uh, and you go back to the same place that same cover and after let's say 100 years and you dig you will find nothing right you will not yes. find a very well preserved skeleton and say that oh this is a fossil so fossil that's why and there has been millions and trillions of organisms dying but we don't find millions and trillions of fossils we find a handful of them because it requires special conditions for something to become a fossil how let me tell you so imagine that fossils are only formed when a living form when it is dead before the dead body gets enough time to degrade it gets trapped between layers of soil that gets hardened over time so like calcareous rocks rocks that have higher calcium content or magnesium content like they can if something gets trapped then it will be pro it will be protected from degradation now if to give an example imagine like a tsunami condition of a tsunami right so sea organisms during a tsunami or an earthquake die suddenly because of things they fall in some pitfall and die suddenly and let's say a horse died in a tsunami 
there was a break in the earth crust the horse fell in the pit died and just on top the moment it died it fell on a rock and a rock fell on top of it and it got squished between two and because of sheer force of soil and everything on top it stayed there it got just it will be like pressed like a paper but it will stay there right or get embedded in some parts of the bone or the soil over time because this was a sudden it got trapped after thousands of years when you will dig that part of earth you will find these bones trapped because they have not they did not get enough opportunities to degrade you keep any bone there's nothing special about dinosaur's bone and human bones the the human fossils that we find we always find them you know in like caves in places where like let's say human ancestors were living in a cave and that cave was a part of a larger water system um underground water system it collapsed because of its sheer weight and you know organisms just got trapped in it and could not get decomposed we don't find otherwise we we would have found human bodies everywhere you dig any ground any battle ground do we when we dig battle ground we find swords we find metals but we don't find human bodies human bodies were also there no they died someone was holding that sword but sometimes we find proper burial places where in a proper manner dead bodies were kept within two rocks like mummies the culture of making uh, coffins of stones and putting well preserved mummies in it so if similar something similar to that happens naturally that is a natural fossil and if humans do it culturally then we find the cultural evidence of human fossils does that make sense iram does that answer your question this same is... thing is with excreta yeah i think your question yes. was about excreta excreta yeah. yes yeah the same thing is about excreta so uh sometimes uh excreta gets hardened and like eggs and excreta gets hardened uh it it is a dry mass it dries and hardens and just like now you think of that egg because you must have been hearing news of scientists found a dinosaur egg but when you look at that egg it looks like someone carved it out of stone so how to believe it's an egg so there are other scientific ways to figure out if it's an real an egg or it is just a round shaped stone we can distinguish between the two but talking about excreta also or something as fragile as egg they got dried they were there and then they si similar to a dead body they got trapped between soil layers where for anything to degrade you need decomposers you need bacteria you need detritivores to reach there but if when when sudden calamities happen they get trapped in a way that layers are formed and now detritivores cannot reach them right so sometimes you take a stone you split it open and in the middle of the stone you will find a impression of a fish now that fish did not go inside a rock clearly fish cannot go inside a rock but when sorry but when that fish would have trapped or would have died that region around it would be clay not rock so it got trapped in a clay a excreta can get trapped in a clay right the clay is wet and then the clay will harden over time and as it will harden because of pressure temperature anything now the detritivores from outside cannot reach and degrade it inside it so it's like pickling you know naturally it got preserved and it it will not happen for all the excreta always it's just some very lucky excreta that got preserved as a as a fossil and excreta is a great source of fossil because it just not it it just does not tell us about the time in which someone pooped it out it also tells it about what was the flora and fauna of that time what kind of things are present if if it is lipid heavy or if, if it is protein heavy or if it is starch heavy by looking at the composition of that excreta uh, to what extent it is preserved etc etc and now does that answer your question you know yes yeah 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 perfect and uh, yeah great we have also just just for your curiosity the mass the the fossil of the mammoth that was found 
well preserved in ice had food in its stomach not properly digested because all the tissues were intact it was in ice it's like you you bring meat and you keep it in your uh, freeze freezer it was like that and scientists got to know a lot about what kind of food you know these vegetarian organisms used to eat back then and you will be surprised to know that people used to think that grasses which are angiosperms now we think that grass you go to a forest you will find grasses everywhere right what if i tell you that at one point of time there were no grasses on the planet because grasses are very very evolved plants they are angiosperms most of them and angiosperms evolved the late they are the latest branch that diversified and took over the planet so at one point of time planet was grass devoid there were ferns bryophytes pteridophytes other kind of plants but not grasses but the the debate again started with some evidences suggesting that we used to think that grasses were not present up until some time but it shows that you know grasses might have evolved a little earlier than we think because evidence are revised does that make sense you know because of food yes yeah great good question so fort fossil evidence is first thing but it's not enough in evidence so scientists went on to think more and more and they also realized that there is something called embryological evidence which is present in every embryo of present life form like high organism embryo so embryological evidence of evolution now what it says is if you so we will we will i will show you some evidence pictures that is there with me in, in the drive if you just give me one second i can pull it out yeah, i'm stop i'm stopping the sharing for some time basically this theory tells that <laughs> at one point of time organisms had a common uh, connection and that connection still is reflective in all our embryos of higher yeah this is this is it this is it great so i found something uh, is it is it can you see the screen that i'm sharing people no i don't think so uh now can you see the screen that i'm sharing no yes sir yeah okay perfect so what you see here this is a very well um documented evidence so these are all the these are all early stage embryos which is which is in the first row and if i just show you the first row now look at this just the first row you all can see just the first row people yes no yes sir yeah look it starts from fish in classification you know that five kingdom classification in that the vertebrate uh, when you go to vertebrates within that you see that the fish are the earliest uh, of the organisms that have a vertebral column followed by rep amphibians reptiles then birds and mammals right so whether it is a fish or a amphibian and reptile or a bird which is chicken or a mammal which is pig cow rabbit and human do you think that all the embryos in the early stage look similar to each other if i give you a pig embryo a early stage pig embryo will you be able to tell me that it is different from a cow a rabbit human or a chicken embryo no right no. you can see similar features like this head bulge it's present in a fish a tortoise but the final product of a fish is very different from the final product of a cow like see all these features are same you also see a big 
eye patch where the eye will develop in future. That's also same. You see gill slits. These are gill slits. They are again same. Even in organisms like human who do not have gills, have gill slits in their their embryo. Now, why is there a gill slit in a human embryo when humans never lived in water? None of our ancestors lived in water. No human species live in water. There is no underwater human species. We breathe through lungs. Then why our early embryo, early stage embryo, has gill slits? Why our early embryo has a tail bud? So you can see all these first stage embryos have a tail bud. In fish, there is no tail, but there is a fin. In salamander, there is a tail. In tortoise, there is a tiny tail. In chicken, there is again no tail. Pig, yes. Cow, yes. Rabbit, yes. Human, no. So whether their uh, adult forms have tail or not, regardless of that, our embryos start the same. So it's like a similar programming works. You know, you start with the baseline code, and then as it prog sorry, uh, sorry, as it progresses. Now let's come to stage two. So from early to a middle stage embryo, you will start seeing some differences. Now the fish looks start to look more like a fish, but still the rabbit and the human look very sim similar because humans are closely related to rabbit and very distantly related to fish. So even in their embryos, the organisms which are very distantly related or not related will distinguish first from each other. And as you go to third stage, now you can see start making some differences between a human and a pig versus a chicken. So a beak-like structure comes in chicken versus a nozzle-like structure with some hoof starts developing in pig. A tail comes up. In humans, it's opposite. So see, in case of a in case of a rabbit, this tail bud continues to grow. In case of a cow, also it continues to grow. But in case of human, it starts to digress. So some signaling is happening. It had a tail bud, but since humans don't have tail, so that tail. So here is a tail for a uh, rabbit here is a tail for cow but there is no tail for human but we had that structure and by the time uh, babies take birth we see very different organisms that take birth as com uh, <clears throat> compared to what they used to look in their early stages of embryology so this is another evidence of evolution and it was proposed by Ernst Haeckel so Ernst Haeckel observed all these embryo, embryonic stages, to, which is common in all vertebrates. So he studied just vertebrates. These are all vertebrate embryos. And he said that there are features present in the embryo that are absent in the adult. And these features uh, um, might, you know, a kind of not directly, but in an indirect manner might point towards our common lineage. Okay. Ernst Haeckel was not very, very rigorous in his, in his uh, assumptions. And he concluded that uh, embryos of all vertebrates, including human, develop something that they don't need first, and then they remove it. But that was found wrong. We only have gill slits in early stage embryo. We never develop gills. Okay. Even though a human baby inside the womb is all surrounded by a liquid around it, but even then we do not develop gills at all. We do not develop tails at all, but our embryo first stage, early stage embryos have all these features. So he was wrong in that part, which was disproved by another scientist called, um, um, Carl von Baer, and he said that embryos never pass through the adult stages of other animals. So if I take a human embryo, I can never do anything to that embryo. So whatever it looks like, it looks very similar. Sorry. It, just like, it, uh -oh. So it looks very similar to a rabbit embryo, but I can never make a human embryo become a rabbit in its adult form. Okay. So there is something that is governing, that is the um, biological mechanism, molecular mechanism. But the fact that embryos share similarity in early stages, 
hint towards a common lineage now this common lineage was not understood well and also was not studied well at that time but now we have evidences of comparative anatomy and morphology and where does these common features come from and that we will do in yeah next class because we are a lot ahead of our time if if anyone has question they can stay back and i am happy to take questions for as long as you want otherwise i i stop here and we'll continue from here in the next class with comparative anatomy evidences and morphology evidences in present organisms yes questions please anyone has questions i, th I think yes, i heard you know yes yes yeah yeah so all the embryos are actually the same right so how do you prove that which ancestor had come first uh right so if i understand your question correctly let me repeat it you are asking that if i take a fish embryo and if i take a um, um, um rabbit embryo how i am saying that fish evolved first and not rabbits is yes, that your exactly. question exactly yeah okay so for that we do not rely on just embryos because as you said embryos look very same even a human embryo looks like a rabbit right and we know that rabbits have been around much before humans like wild species or like but how do we know that in present world we have other ways to figure it out one is we look at their anatomy when they are all developed and adult so a fish has a two chambered heart which is primitive as compared to a four chambered heart that a rabbit has so a two chamber heart cannot keep oxygenated um you know uh, no it keeps oxygenated and deoxygenated blood separate but it cannot uh, efficiently uh, you know divide the blood flow coming from the top body or the uh, bottom body it cannot send it separately to lungs to get oxy uh, oxidized like humans or rabbits can do so that is one feature that tells us that fish is primitive second is we look at uh, we look at the genes that that they have now we can do genome sequencing and we can see that the kind of genes that fish has suppose uh, something came first okay so and something evolved from it so if b evolved from a then b will have some features that a also has right plus b will also have some new features that a doesn't have because a has not evolved enough to become b so rabbits have some additional different features being rabbits that fish does not have but rabbits will share some common features with fish and not just for with fish in fact we share some common features with plants also for example the the fact that we can metabolize glucose through respiration even plants can do that so that gene for that enzy enzyme in 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 slightly different um sequence will also be conserved in lower life form you know we can use bacterial proteins and we can express it in mammalian system and it works this is how we have created rats so we took uh, a bacterial protein called uh, uh, the, the rhodopsin uh, which is also present in eyes a version of it and then you express it genetically in the neurons of a mouse or a house uh, or, or a fly on which i work and then because these are light sensitive channels when you shine light on these channels these channels activate and make the neuron active or you know functioning so if i express these channels taken from bacteria into the neurons of mouse that help the mouse sense fear then what scientists can do is they can just shine light on the neurons of mouse in a open brain setup and the mouse will sense fear without any fear so mouse will behave like it is afraid because the neuron is active because of a completely different protein that was present somewhere else so these are all tools we can just put a behavior by things so we know what came first again for fossil evidence as back as you go in time you will not find rabbit fossils or rabbit like fossils but you will find fish like fossils dating back in time and also genome comparison yes yes sir
Yeah. Uh, but sir, if you like claim that a fish has evolved, sorry, a salamander has evolved from a fish, a tortoise mm -hmm. has evolved from a salamander, then why mm -hmm. there are fish and salamanders still? Exactly. So that's what I'm, I, I will be telling you that what we are talking about are finished products. So salamander and tort tortoise did not come from salamander. For that matter, we still have bacteria on the planet. If multicellular life came from unicellular life, why, why not all unicellular life has become multicellular over millions of years? Why we still have unicellular life? That is what is a misconception, a big misconception in evolution that it's linear. It follows one path. We go to class six, we go to class seven, we go, go to class eight. It's not like that. Tortoise has not evolved from salamander. Salamander, tortoise, human, rabbits, cow have evolved for the same amount of time on the planet. But when salamanders evolved, it's like branching descent. There was a common ancestor from which, uh, from which amphibians and reptiles evolved parallelly. Okay, do you understand what I'm trying to say here? So yes. all the fish that we see today were not present millions of years ago. These fish are also evolved like tuna, hilsa, sharks. All these fish were not present exactly like they are. So we, you can't say that uh, tortoise came from shark. Shark and tortoise both are evolved. They have, But when you go back, trace their ancestors, you will find at one point of time, they had common ancestor which looked nothing like both. So the common ancestor of salamander and tortoise will be very different from both salamander and tortoise. Based on different selection pressures, one evolved to become a salamander, the other evolved to become a reptile. 